Hello everybody. Well, this is the video I've been wanting to make for quite some time about uh, collecting cast iron or uh, what to collect or what not to collect. Um, if it's up to me, just collect it all. You see a piece of cast iron, just buy it. Just just get it all. Quantity over quality. That's my, my logo. <laughs> and there's a few hundred skillets kicking around under the shed and in the garage and my wife will tell you that um, I'm, I'm gone way too far. Anyway, so I'd like to start at the beginning. <laughs> And uh, I've, what I've got here on the table is a, uh, some uh, examples of uh, the cast iron that I have. And what I like to do is, uh, I guess the best thing to do is kind of start at the beginning. I guess, uh, first off, you do believe everything you hear on the internet just because I said it. Uh, I'm only kidding. This is just what I know. Um, some of it might not be factual. This is the stuff I've learned on the internet and stuff I've learned over the years collecting this stuff. So I hope what I'm telling you is truthful. Um, if it isn't truthful, let me know and I'll change my story. But uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty well read on this stuff. So here's what I believe. Or everything I'm going to tell you is what I believe. Um, first off, you can go way back when they first started manufacturing cast iron. They had what's called a gate mark. This piece is the only piece I have with a gate mark. And I guess the story is that these old farmers and cowboys or whatever, they would make their own cast iron. They, You could buy the mold and they'd get their ore, however that worked, I, I don't know, and they, they would make their own. And this this gate mark is a, uh, a product of their mold and they would break that off and, and uh, sand it or grind it down and then they would have something that they could use for ever or until I ended up with it, I guess. So um, that's a gate mark when you hear people talk about a gate mark. And uh, typically it'll have a... a a heat ring, it's not called a smoke ring, it's called a heat ring on the outside here, like that. And it's pretty smooth, pretty nice, pretty nice, uh, the molds were smooth. Alright, so there's that one. Then they went into making, uh, uh, Griswold started making the, their different series of Erie only stamped cast iron. Uh, it didn't say Griswold on it, it just said Erie. And the first series would have uh, an Erie at the top, and they had different logos and Odds and ends. But anyway, it just said Erie on it. And then they had a different kind of handle on it, like um, like this right here. This The handle, the actual shape of the handle would change. I don't have an example of all of them, or else I'd be happier. But uh, this is a second series Erie. And you can tell, it's not very easy to see, but you can see Erie here. And then the second series Erie also had typically a number in the middle. And then it would also have some kind of number at the very bottom. It's hard to see. I haven't cleaned this pan very much since I got it. So this is a second series Erie. This is pre-1905, maybe 1900. They, they made them like from 1895 to 1905 or s something like that. Not, I'm not exactly sure of those dates, but this is a... Uh, definitely one of my oldest pans and uh, I came up on a pile of them at the flea market a whole pile of cast iron and this is only a few months ago and I was walking the guy had seven or eight pans and I saw that how thin this pan was you can see when it's stacked with a bunch of other skillets that it's thin for instance here you can you can see the difference of how thin that is on those two pans so uh, I picked it up and I knew that I wasn't going to let go of it, man. Once I had it, I knew it wasn't coming back out of my hands. And uh, the guy hemmed and hawed a little bit and I said, well, what's the best you do? And he said, well, he said, I'd like to try to get $10 from it if I can. So I gave $10 for a second series Erie and um, I felt bad about it for about four seconds and I ran to the truck and actually put it under the seat to finish out walking around the flea market because uh, um, it's definitely the oldest pan I have. So they made the Erie's. For, until like uh, 1905, I think it was, 1911, um, I had some notes up here, I think, um, in that time frame. And then, uh, then they started pl placing the regular, the old Griswold or the uh, circular Griswold, I'll show you in just a minute. But um, what they would do is when they were done with the second series and third series, is they would sell those molds when they changed to the next series. They would sell the molds to other companies. So for instance, like Wapak. Here's a Wapak skillet. You see the finish on that? Nice. It, it looks just like a mirror. And you can't get in. You can, you, can, you can 
you could burn anything on here and it just simply falls back out. It's no big deal. So this is a Wapak. It's not in great condition, but it is a Wapak. And this is what's called a Ghost Eerie. And if you can see it, it says Eerie above the Wapak. It's real hard to see, but it's in there. Maybe you guys can send freeze frame it or, or somehow see it in a different way. So this pan was an Eerie pan and they sold it to this manufacturer and they continued to make pans with it. This one was actually a chrome pan at one time. It was actually a chrome, they had the, the, the uh, nickel plated pans and of course over the last hundred years the nickel has just worn off. But I use this pan all the time. I use it once a week or so and it's one of my favorite pans along with the older stuff. I try to use the older stuff because I think it should be used. I, I, uh, I take care of it but I sure do use it. Alright, so meanwhile um, Erie or Griswold, before it was named Griswold, they'd make pans for other companies, for Sears and uh, there's a whole list of companies they'd make them for. So what you have is you have a, a pan similar to this. I have a couple of them. They have a pan similar to this that that is identical, but it doesn't have a name on it. And these were their economy brands. They were cheaper. I don't know the dollar figures, but they were actually a little cheaper than buying a regular Erie or Griswold pan. All right, and here's another one here. Here's an, an unmarked, really thin pan. You can tell how thin it is. And it's uh, got a great finish on it. But again, it doesn't have a name on it. So this would be probably made by Erie, but no trademark. And meanwhile, they had uh, Wagnerware was making pans. They started making pans a little bit later than Erie, but they started making them uh, same design. I've got one of those right here. Here's an old Wagner Ware. It says Sydney on it. Sydney O. The O stands for Ohio. They're made in Sydney, Ohio. This has a model number. And it has that outside heat ring. And again, the finish on the pan is, is like glass. It was actually the silica or the sand they used for the mold. It wasn't the metal, it was the mold that they used. And the, the, the uh, sand was finer than what they use now. Okay, so now you can zoom forward a few years in the 20s, and then they started making Griswold, the, the large um, uh, trademark, and then they, that's when they went to this trademark. And it would have Griswold, Erie, USA, what it was, and usually some kind of number. And a lot of times it would have a number on the handle. It's not the size of the pan, it's just the model number or the brand number. Now these are the ones that they sold in sets. They sold these in sets of uh, 10 or 12, 11, and it came with a stand and all that kind of stuff. So most people are trying now are trying to recreate those sets. And I think the number 12 is the hardest because it was the most used pan. And um, they would always get broken or thrown away. So the 12 is the hardest one to find. It's the most valuable for sure. And I've got another one here. Here's just a smaller one, little egg pan. And it's also a, the large Griswold. Nice pan, but thicker, a lot thicker. You can tell them by looking at them when you see them in a pile or in a collection. You can tell from quite a ways away. And also back in that time, there were a lot of other manufacturers. There was a, the Martin Stove Company. Looks like that. I think it was in Alabama. And they made them. They were prolific. They made, they made billions of them. They made them forever and ever. And here's a smaller um, Wagner Ware. It's just a smaller pan. All right. Then we go to a little bit later. Probably let, let's go into the 40s. Now we're up in the late 40s, up until 1957 or so. The the uh, Griswold logo changed from the large logo, and actually changed. It went down a little bit to this size. If you can see that. All right, and then finally it ended up this small. It ended up real small. And it would say Erie PA. And that was until um, 1957. In 1957, some other company, I don't know the name, bought Griswold and they also bought Wagnerware. 
and they merged the two companies. And from then on, that cast iron is actually considered um, uncollectible. They they don't uh, they didn't they, people don't uh, collect it much. So um, I would if I could find it, I'd collect it. I don't care because it's still cast iron. But it's considered uncollectible because it, it's just not as valuable. So I also have a a, a six 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 colonial breakfast skillet. Those are kind of cool. That's the one with the with the, th the three different spots to cook your two eggs and bacon in or whatever you want to cook. I got that on eBay. And then um, we can go to Lodge. The next evolution really is Lodge because Lodge took over sometime in the 70s and of course everybody knows they still make them now. But uh, a Lodge pan um, can be identified pretty quick by the it's thick the, and the heat ring is inset. Here's a, here's a standard lodge pan. Most of you guys watching this are going to know lodge pan from anything else. It's a much heavier pan. You can tell. Use it as a number on the handle. And with lodge, even the unmarked lodges, they did a uh, economy also. With the lodges, it would typically be a notch at, the, at 12, a notch at 9, and a notch at 3. So a lot of times you can tell, even without picking these pans up, you go to the flea market or Garage sale, you can just feel underneath the pan. You can tell, you know, if it's even worth picking up or not. Because there's a lot of reproductions of these uh, skillets that don't have a break in the heat ring. Um, also, um, like for instance, this this larger skillet. That's my one of my favorite ones. We use this for all kinds of stuff. And again, you can tell it's a lodge. It doesn't say lodge anywhere on it, but it. 12 o'clock and at 3 o'clock and at 9 o'clock there's a notch so that's a lodge no matter what what else is going on the three notches tell you that it's a lodge and it's a little bit older pan it's smooth here's a newer one this is a um, probably modern day um, it's unmarked it says made in USA but um, and you can tell the grain of the cast iron the mold is just not the same and they're harder to cook on. They, you can still cook on them. I mean, people use them all the time. I use it all the time. But it's amazing the difference from the new mold system from the older ones where the, the uh, silica was so much finer and made such a better uh, uh, finish on these pots and pans. I found this one at the flea market a few months ago, and I can't find out much about it. Maybe somebody knows. This says uh, Farmer's Furniture, 43rd anniversary. I got it for a couple of dollars. And I'm sure it's not worth a million, but it was just kind of cool. It's never been used. I haven't even seasoned it. I just put some oil on it, and uh, it's just kind of cool. I couldn't turn it down for three big dollars. So that's pretty much it. Of course, now there's uh, Dutch ovens. We could do a whole video on Dutch ovens. This is a big modern-day Lodge Dutch oven. I have quite a few of them. I've got some hanging up over here, some newer ones and older ones. And we use those a lot in the fall and in the winter, making chili and you know spaghetti, that wintertime kind of food. Not too much in the summer. Sometimes I'll put country ribs or something and let them sit on the grill for a while. But uh, I'm going to stop it there. That's about it. That's a, a good start for everybody. The cast iron cleaning and maintaining and all that kind of stuff, there's plenty of videos out there for that. I, um, I don't use electrolysis. Uh, a lot of times, especially with the lesser quality pieces, I chuck them right in the fire. Um, what I'll do is I'll start a fire in the fireplace or out in the, in the fire pit and I'll put these on the grill if it's especially bad like for instance this one I wouldn't do it with this one because it's more precious but this has a lot of crud on it and in order to clean that what I would do is I would put this on the grill with nothing in it and let it heat up to almost red hot as long as you bring up the temperature gradually you, sh you shouldn't have any issues I've never had any problem with one and then take it set it on the fire and come back in the morning and pick it out and it's just like brand new like you never actually used the pan or seasoned it and then of course you go through the process that's what I usually do now if the pans worth a bunch of money or it's really an old pan I wouldn't risk doing that but the majority of the lodges of these Dutch ovens and stuff that's you know 10 or 15 dollars it's just a waste of time taking the and, and spending all that time trying to scrub it in electrolysis it's just chuck it in the fire and it comes out like new every time so that's it I hope you guys enjoyed it sorry we didn't do any cooking uh, this weekend, 4th of July, we'll do some cooking for sure, I promise. And uh, thank you guys again. Mash that like button for me. I appreciate it. And tell all your friends, and we'll, uh, we'll keep making these. So thanks, guys. Appreciate it.